So late at night, I'm thinking about a conversation. It's not late at night. It's almost morning. I hear rockets going off in the distance and the sun is coming up. I can see it through my skylights. But I was thinking about a conversation I had yesterday on webcam with some people. And they're thinking about moving out of their country and they're looking for intentional community. So I was thinking about that a lot and, and some of the hardcore things I said in that conversation, which maybe they'll post a video and I'll include them in this video. It's hardcore shit, you know, that is inappropriate. <laughs> I'm no longer an appropriate person because I've spent too much time alone and I'm a mess, you know, uh, socially. I'm badly trained, but at least I'm honest. And maybe that's a good thing. Maybe I've broken far enough away, I can actually get some shit done to help this world out and make it better. Because people are being victimized, or they're victimizers, or in most cases, both. And that's just how it is. But these poor folks are just looking for a place to live where they can be safe and have some community. Everybody says they want that, right? Lots and lots of people say they want that. Well, they're not going to get it. They're fucking up. And I had some harsh thoughts about it that weren't well formulated. I waited till the end of the conversation to say anything. And I told myself, I'm not going to say anything in this conversation. Because it's not going to be positive. And I want to, occasionally I think I should have a positive vision for the world to present to people. But the problem is, all the positive visions people are giving people are full of fucking lies to manipulate them and use them and steal from them. And these poor folks looking for land to buy and, you know, they're older and they don't want to build a new house. You know what they really want? Well, I'll talk about that later, maybe. Maybe this will be a long video because I got a bunch of things to say about it that aren't real easy. They're not what people are used to hearing. But a lot of these folks, they just want a comfortable place to be with nice people. And what's being offered to them is expensive places and places they don't know where they have no legal recourse after they're fucked over. And they don't know how to match up with each other. They're going to match up with people that don't match with their values, meaning that they're going to be controlled or disappointed. And they're going to end with the same shitty world or worse than they're in now. So that's my intro to this video. I'm going to uh, try and take a nap before I haven't slept a lot. Try and take a nap before the sun comes too far up. And then uh, maybe make this video for you. Because maybe you need it. Because like me, well, I'm a very lonely guy. I've chosen that. And it's helped me to think for years and years and years about how human relations work. And I'm still online. I see the mess that is online. And I, and I also read about people's lives and how unhappy they are and trapped. And they want something different. But unfortunately, the set of solutions that they're coming up with are not ones that are going to actually work and benefit them. That seems to be the case. And, and the, the common problems that people have when they try and create community uh, happen over and over. And you can tell before the community even starts, it's going to fail. In other words, you're not going to get what you want. You're not going to be fulfilled. In, in what the common society offers you and in what the alternatives offer you. The alternatives often throw the baby out with the bathwater and offer you some delusional, you know, pseudo-spiritual bullshit that, well, anyway, I'll save the ranting for later. I got to try and relax myself and take a nap or something. I'm not going to be able to take a nap. There's no way. My mind really is just on fire. It's going out to these people. It goes out to me. I mean, I want what I don't have. What's nice is I haven't been distracted by the regular confusions. And so I I think I can see some vision clearer now. And after a lifetime, unlike most of these people, a lot of these people, it's their first time looking into communities, right? My whole life has been in communities of various kinds. I have flitted through them. I grew up in ones that I was not compatible with. I flitted through others and saw how they worked and didn't work, and I judged them and was judged, of course. And so I'm going to try and offer you some clearer perspectives on what the problem set is and what I believe some of the solution set is. 
And some of it's real obvious and good. Some of my solutions are so simple, you'll wonder why you didn't think of it. I'll see you later. I took a sleeping pill as the sun was coming up and got some sleep I was missing. I had a very interesting dream. Let me tell you about it. In my dream, I was back in the city. I was re-entering the workforce, as perhaps I should do, although I always imagined doing it online. Doing the kind of work I was doing before, and they were building a new building. A whole big complex of buildings that had a bunch of other services within it. So you could buy stuff in it. It was like partly mall, and I was looking for my office. I had been in my office. I was going to share an office with eight other people in this huge room. So it wasn't quite like a cubicle farm, but, you know, I was kind of figuring out, like, what part of the office would be mine on my shits laying in a pile. And um, I was thinking I'd go for the corner because I like to have my back up against the wall. But then there was a big window that looked out on some park-like area, and I thought it might be nice to be semi-outside, although I was concerned about the sun flowing in, so I was worried about the angle of the sun. And a friend of mine was just restarting the company at the same time. He was restarting to work with the same company, which was pretty exciting. And uh, I woke up just really excited to go back to work. You know, because I, I, I liked working at that company. It was the same company I worked at before, and I liked the kind of puzzles that we were dealing with solving. And then right after I woke up, I was just really excited to have something new to do. Because, like, I don't have anything to do. I'm, I'm here. Hi, honey. You have things to do. Yeah, you good boy. Good boy. Arr, arr. And, and I'm excited about my own project again because I realize there's so many people looking for, because I've been talking to a lot of people online, so many people not being fulfilled with what they want. They're not getting it. And I know what they want more than they do. I'm watching them flounder around. They're going to get ripped off. They're going to be victimized. Because they have needs, they have wants, but they're not able to express them and formulate them because most of the world is just going to try and suck energy off them and screw them over. I mean, they're making laws in England you can't even own a chicken without registering it, which means you're going to have to apply, which means they can say no. What are you so excited about? You excited because I'm excited? Okay, don't jump on me, dude. What is it you need? You need more love. See, even my dogs are lonely. They need love. And, and I'm not offering it. I'm just one guy here, and, and like, that's one of my favorite dogs. He's a beautiful dog. He's a big, huge dog. He's got his brother here. His brother's overeating because his brother <laughs> cares about food and love, and right now, food more than love. Uh, but I think I've, I finally have gotten to a point where I can fit these different pieces all together and get a lot of people in the met. Because this is one thing I said in a, in, a, in a talk yesterday online, was that people simply don't have at all the same needs. And when they get, and when they say, let's make an intentional community or something, they, they say, well, let's all, you know, whatever. They, they think they want to get together with people like them. That is not true. They need to get to the, together with people who have compatible needs as them, so their needs are all getting met by each other, and they're all serving in the way they wish to serve. Wow. And I mean, it isn't like I suddenly came to this realization. It's, it's I've been working up to this for a very long time, looking at the puzzle of how can things actually work. And, and I, I still don't probably know exactly how to fit all that together, but I know that if I present the different types of needs which can be solved and attract the people who want that thing, then I can stick them all together and have systems that serve them all 
and we can all be very wealthy, not just in terms of financial income, although that's totally important, and I want to be having a place that is just doing really well, but the way to do that is to have people being so motivated that they're creating so much that we have no problem producing and having an income. And we are producing amazing children who are raised to be little geniuses or be happy in their lives, which is probably more important. Not everyone has to be a genius. In fact, I'm not sure I would wish that as a curse on someone. But I look around and I have this amazing base of a place. And I don't know how to utilize it. And I think of many single ways I can utilize it. And none of them make sense to me. It has to be a whole bunch of stuff mixed together, connected with each other. And that's really the ultimate permaculture way of thinking about it. You know, and people can have different types of relationships that fit in with what they want and need. They can have different kinds of jobs that fit in with what they want and need. And there's things they can't be. They can't just live off of other people. You know, you talk about economic systems where people are living off the labor of others. Well, we can just have no jobs like that. We can structure it so that, you know, we only recruit people here who want to create be beneficial to others, uh, a lot of jobs that work remotely and bring money in from the outside, some jobs that serve internally, some jobs that produce information product, although that industry may go away or change a lot. Well, it's going to change. And then some people who produce physical products. And of those, physical products is the one that matters the longest term, but it isn't the most profitable now. So we have to go both those directions hardcore. And we can do physical products better than ever before. We can do agriculture better than it's ever done before. Better than it was done with ancient food forest farming. We can make modern food forest farming and have it work better than anything else that's ever existed in the history of agriculture. I can see it. It can be done. And it's not a couple tricks. It's not a little bit of technology involved. There's some technology involved. All right. <laughs> I'm energetic because I just woke up, but thinking about the work involved is tough. The only way it's going to work is if I can involve a lot of other people who agree to very strict sets of social conventions of how we deal with each other. And that system has to be protected against those who will use it and destroy it. I have no illusions about that. I'm not a dumbass hippie. Hopefully I'm a really smart hippie. And if I'm going to make anything that's amazing like I'm talking about, I'm going to have to work with a lot of other really smart people who understand that we're going to have to break away from what was and be careful as hell at creating what can be. We have to question every bit of it. I have very clear visions on it because I've been working on it for 20 years here and all my life actually. We'll see. So regarding the conversation I had online last night, in which I didn't speak until the very end, and then I just rant a little bit, and the conversation was over. <laughs> I did not communicate in a good way, probably. And I didn't even address the things that those people cared about. So I'm going to try and do that now, with a little bit more intelligence and thought. Uh, these are people who are generally older. They want to move out of the United States. And Mexico is a very good option for them. It is cheaper only if you do it right. Because you can certainly spend a lot of money in Mexico. There's plenty of rich people in Mexico who spend a lot. Uh, or you can live really cheaply. But uh, somewhere in the middle there is a gradient of lifestyle. So. If you want to live a fancy, rich lifestyle in Mexico, it's not necessarily going to be a lot cheaper than doing so in the U.S. 
especially when you consider that you may be divided from the people you know, the opportunities you know, the culture you understand, and the language you speak. That's going to raise your costs because you don't know how to do things in cheaper ways. So moving to Mexico for a cheaper lifestyle may not actually be a very smart option for you. Uh, certainly, there are many options there. But, in order to immigrate to Mexico, immigrate, immigrate, immigrate from somewhere, immigrate to somewhere, I guess. If you want to be an immigrant, then Mexico is not very welcoming to poor people. They require, in 2024, I think you need, you know, like $3,500 a month income that you can show for a fairly large sum of money, a lump sum, to show that you're not going to be any kind of financial burden. Now that is way more than most people need to live in Mexico very comfortably. But what they're saying is they don't want poor people moving to Mexico. Which is a little bit ironic since there's so many impoverished Mexicans moving to the U.S. to work. And the Mexican government supports that. But I don't want to get into politics. I'm not in charge of any of that. It certainly doesn't match up though, and it does make me wonder, what if the U.S. and Mexico had equal immigration laws? That is actually great food for thought. Like, what if Mexico had the same as the U.S., or the U.S. had the same as Mexico, or some other system which you can imagine? I'm trying to fall down here with these mud puddles. Oh, there's mosquitoes, baby mosquitoes on these puddles. That's not good. I got a lot of standing water this year. Anyway, so Mexico I consider to be the best option in the world of where to move to. But there's a lot of videos about that and a lot of people who disagree with me. And uh, I guess it depends on how you do it. I'll tell you this. People have requirements for where they would want to move to in Mexico and where they wouldn't, but they often don't know enough about Mexico to know where those places are. So I'm going to describe some of those to you. Number one, do you need to be within driving distance of the border? You can be driving back and forth. Now that's a subset of people probably, but it's some. It's people in San Diego, people in Texas, people in Arizona, anywhere near the, near the border. So. The problem is that anywhere you move to in Mexico that you're going to drive to really easily isn't going to have a lot of trees. It's going to be desert. And it's not going to have a lot of economic opportunity with the exception of perhaps if you were going to move to Monterey. Monterey is not that far from Mexico, from Texas, sorry. And so you could do that. But presumably a lot of these people are retired. They have an income and they want to move to Mexico on that. So they're not going to be working, so they don't have to be in an urban location. Now I still just personally would not want to live in the desert. So Baja is out for me. A lot of people move to Baja from California and they're still close to the U.S. And that's cool. So we'll skip that conversation mostly. It's a very little interest to me. And you can do your own research if it is. Most people will be flying in. Or driving far very rarely. There's people who, who are like snowbirds. They come down for half the year. They go up for the other half. And it used to be that they could come in on a tourist visa. Uh, and stay for six months. Leave and come back all the time. The government has cracked down on that. Mexican government. So if you're going to be here that much. You need to get a residency visa either temporary or permanent resident visa. Again, that's going to cost you. Now, maybe money is not your problem. I hope it isn't. But uh, let's assume it isn't, because otherwise this whole conversation is pretty much pointless. Although, actually, that's not true. There's other ways. You could get married. You could have a kid in Mexico. There's a whole bunch of other cases. But let's stick with the people I was talking to yesterday. They're older. They're not going to be having any new kids. They're not going to birth a child and, and have an anchor baby here in Mexico. So, uh, And then for younger folks, working in Mexico is possible, difficult, could be done. But you'd be better off being like a remote worker 
making your money somewhere else and moving to Mexico. And maybe I should make a different video about that. That's a great option. If you want to be a remote worker, digital nomad type, drop me a note. I might have a great place for you to be. A place that's cheap and comfortable to live, where there's lots of cheap fruits and veggies, good healthy living, uh, clean air. It's a wonderful place. So anyway, back to these old folks. So the other choice you've got to make is the coast or the highlands. And of course, there's a little bit of space in between. Well, on the coast, it's really hot. And I'm just going to call all of the Yucatan area, Quintana Roo, etc., all hot. That's all coast. Way hot for me. Use a site called weatherspark.com. Weather like climate. Weather like how's the weather today. Weatherspark, one word, dot com. Put in places to compare. Put in places whose climates you know. And then different places in your target location. In this case, probably Mexico. And uh, check the climate. Because... Personally, I don't want to live in a place that you have to run air conditioning all the time. I don't want to live in a place that's so cold that it snows a bunch of the year and I have to use energy for heating. In fact, to generalize that, I would say I don't want to live in a place where I have to use any energy to heat or cool my home. And that is especially possible if you design your house for any kind of passive solar at all. Now, maybe you're going to be buying a house, maybe you're going to be building. That did come up in conversation. Some of these, are too, some of these folks are too old to, to want to get involved with building. Now, maybe if buying land was easy and they had a building team they could trust, everything was trustworthy, maybe they'd go for it. But they would rather buy something or rent something. In fact, buying might not even be a good idea. So back to the coast. The coast is too hot for most people, too hot for me. But some people love that shit. But you should go stay there for a while and make sure you really do. Because it is hot. And it's muggy part of the year. I mean, I would go there in February, you know, for a vacation on the coast. But I like living up in the highlands. Where nights do get chilly here. But it never snows, you know. And I could always light a fire. I'm usually too lazy to do so. So the highlands, if you look at a population density map of Mexico, that's where most people live. And most of them live in Guadalajara, Mexico City, uh, Guanajuato, Querétaro. Actually, I don't know how, how big Guanajuato is. I've never even been there. Uh, uh, most people live in the highlands. There's reasons for that. It's way more comfortable. And if you have the option of designing your house and you design it for passive solar, then all year long you can be perfectly comfortable. The rains come in the summer, the winters are dry and sunny, generally speaking, so it's a perfect climate to be comfortable all year long without using any extra energy. Because that energy is going to cost you. It's going to increase your cost of ownership of your house for a long, long time. Uh, so let's see, the coast versus highlands. I go highlands. Other people make their own choices. If you were going to go to the coast, Merida is far, far away from the U.S. and Canada. But it's a nice city, supposedly, if you like cities. I prefer smaller places, personally. Uh, but some people want a city. Merida might be a good choice. I don't know. Definitely avoid any tourist spot. Which gets us into a bigger issue, and that is language. Uh, you probably want to be around people who speak your language. You might think, oh, I'll move to a place where everybody speaks only Spanish, which is most of the country, and I'll be all right. I'll learn Spanish in six weeks. No, you won't. You'll get barely functional in six weeks. Uh, maybe you're super smart. I'm a pretty smart guy, but I'm not real great with languages, to be honest. I'm not a polyglot. I speak one and a half languages. I speak English really well despite how much I abuse English. But hey, that's what English is for. It's a messy language. It's not a perfect language. So I'll make up any word I want. I'll misuse words. I'll do it just for fun or to piss you off. But Spanish, also a really relaxed language. <coughs> People are very forgiving if you speak bad Spanish. But I make grammatical errors still. I've been here a long time. Of course, I live out in the woods, so that slows down my language learning ability. For a while, I was seeing a Mexican woman, and 
my Spanish got better much faster. So anyway, most people are going to want to live where there's other people who speak English. Well, all of those places cost a heck of a lot more. You look at Lake Chapala, San Miguel Allende. Uh, you definitely want to avoid places like Cancun because that's tourists and English. And anything touristy, the more touristy it is, the more expensive it is. Now, around Chapala is probably your best option. There's theoretically more culture and fancy people in San Miguel. It's closer to Mexico City. I've never even been to Lake Chapala, and I've barely been to San Miguel. I think I spent a total of about four hours there. And I had to go to the consulate once, and I bought some books there. But I would avoid San Miguel just due to price. Uh, it depends. I mean, if price isn't a problem for you, then maybe you'd love to be there. And then Chapala has a bunch of small towns around it that, that might give you what you want. So I don't know if I can recommend doing what I did. I moved to a place where nobody speaks English except a few people. And uh, it makes everything harder. I mean, I did everything the hardest way possible, but that's me, that's my style. And the people I was talking to don't want to do things in the hardest way possible. In fact, a lot of them are talking to people who have land deals where they'll sell them a lot, you know, in Mexico or Costa Rica for $22,000 for a tiny ass lot. Don't fall for that shit. There's so many land scams here. People selling land they don't even own. People selling land, you know, and then there's no plan to build a house and they're going to screw you over on building a house and you don't know how to build a house here. You don't know who to trust. And the likelihood is you're going to find people you can't trust who are recommended by other people you can't trust. So for these older folks I'm thinking of, I don't even think they should buy land, to be honest. I think they should rent. Now, that sounds scary because, I mean, I'm the kind of guy who wants to own land, right? Maybe they should buy a house. That would work. And a lot of these people talk about intentional community. That's what they're looking for because they don't want to be alone. Well, one really good option, and I didn't bring this up in the conversation because I was already just in rant mode and not even addressing their needs very well at all. Sorry, people, but it happens. I'm not very well trained socially anymore. Uh-oh. This is the slippery part. God, there needs to be more than one trail around here. So at that point, I fell down suddenly, and my camera cut out. And I did keep recording, but it was not recording. Uh, I fell down on my backpack with a beer bottle, this one in my backpack, right on my spine. And uh, yeah, so that's what happened, but it wasn't recorded. So, in my backpack, I had this beer bottle, and it hit me, it's vertical in my backpack, and it hit me directly in the spine as I fell backwards right onto my spine on fucking rock-hard mud. It's packed in slippery mud is what it is. Now I got dirt on my camera. I got dirt on my hand, my leg, and probably my ass. Fuck. And I was just talking about how slippery this is. Fuck. Uh, I could have walked way up there. It skipped all this. There's my hat. I get my fucking hat. Uh, all right. Okay, I don't think I cracked my spine. Here comes a fucking dude. Ugh. Uh. My spine's killing me. It can't be broken, though. All right, I still can make it to town. I was going to go to town and walk down to another place, but I think this time I'm just going to go to town close by. Have a beer, get another one, walk home. Now the question is, can I get to town without slipping again? Because I think I'm all right, although my back really hurts. Oh, fuck. All right, I'm going to go off this trail 
avoid that trail and I'm going to walk on leaves. So one of the reasons people want to live with other people is because it's safer. Also, it's socially more fulfilling. And being socially fulfilled does involve living with people who speak your language. Now, some people will be critical of that, of course. But they're assholes. Like, are you critical of Mexicans who move to the States and they hang out with Mexicans? Most of my friends do that. I mean, why wouldn't they? And you're going to be a critical asshole who's, who's going to say, oh, these immigrants, they don't speak English. Because a bunch of them don't. No, it's America. It's fine. And yes, there's a difference between the country and the continents. We all know that. Don't be a dick. Uh, all right, this is slippery a little bit in here, too. I could almost slipped the other day in here. Fuck. See, if I had sand, I could pour it on this, and that would fix it. The other option would be to cut out stairway things in it. All right. Again, risky. Go over here. Go over here. Go over here. All right. Fuck, man. Um, so, it's okay if you're not a bigoted fuck to accept that people want to live with people like them to some degree. That's all right. In fact, we should encourage it, and, and, and I want to help set that up. I would recommend to these folks, if they want an intentional community, they don't want to get screwed over, that they purchase property that they own the deed to in the same location that they have picked with all the other people that they think are like them enough that they want to be neighbors with them. You don't have to have the conflict of shared ownership. Shared ownership sucks. Shared ownership always turns out bad. Couples can't even own kids together and continue to be happy. They get divorced and they fight over the kids. The kids become tools. They get psychologically damaged. We get generational damage going on. And groups of people co-owning land will always result in a power differential. And one of the guys in the conversation was saying how he doesn't like power differentials, but then was mentioning a community he's going to go visit in Costa Rica, where one guy is the spiritual leader, and he's got his people around him who all agree with him. And it's like, uh, there's inherent hierarchy here, and spirituality is actually designed extremely well to keep control over people. It's made up bullshit. It's snake oil used to control you. So this guy specifically is going to go look into a thing that if he looks at it carefully at all with a critical mind is not going to meet the other needs he stated. All right. So the answer is don't do that unless that's OK with you. But the simplest solution is to pick a spot. You you find a bunch of people and you say, we're all going to move to this general location. This doesn't even have to do with moving from country to country. You could do this back in the States. You could say, hey. We all live in this city. We all like each other. And anytime a house comes up for sale in this particular area, we're going to pay more than anyone else to buy it. We're all going to live within walking distance of each other. We're going to be able to do group purchases together. We can give each other rides places. We can help each other out in so many ways. We can have friends around us. That's an intentional community without all the problems that communities have, like constant meetings and, you know, bullying, underlying bullying with pretend consensus decision making and just every common problem that every single uh, com uh, uh, intentional community has that they pretend they don't. That You can see that the intentional community is going to fail before it even starts. So that's a solution for you. Find like-minded people and figure out what like-minded means. Break that down into specific issues, specific topics, hundreds of them. You know, do you want to have kids or not? Do you want to party or not? Uh, do you want to do illegal things? Do you want to start businesses together? Do you want to make a lot of money? Do you want to host a bunch of people? Do you want to have workshops? Or do you want to live quiet and alone? Uh, do you have rules about playing amplified music? Uh, uh, do you all have to be vegans, you know? Because uh, there's a whole bunch of these people looking for communities, and they all have to be vegans. It's very important to them, which is fine. Got to make sure I don't slip in here as well. God damn it. All right. God, that was not a good fall. I've been expecting that fall. Oh, man. All right. Fuck everything. 
Um, so I don't, the only reason I can think of why somebody wouldn't go for that, why they wouldn't go for just buy your own stuff, right? Is because they're looking to mooch off someone else, whether they consciously know that or not. A lot of people don't consciously know that, but it makes sense, right? You can still voluntarily interact and lower your costs and have all the advantages of the community, but each individual in the community has their own space, they have their own security, and they're better off. Now, I can imagine things better than that too, but that should be the go-to solution for most people. Uh, all right, that's it for me for now. All right, so to continue with the topic, uh, that's one option is buy places near each other and, and move there. Now, if you really do find people with similar enough values, you may want to do something else that could benefit you greatly. This is beyond what these other folks want. I mean, I hope I've addressed that and I hope I've disillusioned them that <coughs> they they're going to get ripped off by almost any community that they get involved with. Uh, owning land is a whole other thing. By the way, on the coast, you can't own land directly. You have to do it through a land trust. And so that's within 50 kilometers or 100 kilometers of the border. So that's something to consider. I wouldn't want to buy that kind of land. Uh, you have to make sure your deed is clear if you're buying land. Don't buy a Hito land if you're a foreigner in any cases. Um, Hito land is cooperatively owned land, communally owned land that you have no business buying. It's not even an idea for Mexicans to buy it, in my opinion. You can read about that online. Uh, another option for you, if you do have a bunch of people with resources who are like-minded, is to buy a larger piece of property in a good area and divide it up so you all have a piece and then you have some that's communally owned as well. And in order to administer that, you're going to have to set up some kind of nonprofit, some kind of corporation or something. Uh, there's a whole bunch of legal structures for that in Mexico. Uh, and I have solutions I'm going to use for the property that I own so that I can have people there. And it's going to only be open to people I really like and agree with. So I'm not even going to talk about that. Um, but that is another option. Uh, in, the, in that case, you definitely would want to be careful also, in any, no matter where you move in Mexico, make sure you move to a place where people want you there, where, where you're welcome. Uh, just like in the U.S., there's places that are not welcoming of outsiders. I would hope that all of them would be, but they're probably not. And in Mexico, there's places that are not welcome to outsiders. They're not welcoming. Uh, so don't move there. Why would you do that? You know, and definitely don't come in as a group of outsiders and then be a bunch of weirdos. That ends up being a recipe for trouble pretty much anywhere. And you can read about all these experiments in the 60s with communes and communities and shit. And they rarely it went well. If you do that, no matter where you're at, actually, I would recommend doing the following. Capture rain and store it. There's calculations. This is true no matter where you are now, okay? So regardless of whether you're moving countries or not. Uh, capture rain and store it. You can calculate. There's a formula for how much square are feet or meters of vertical area there is and then how much rain you can theoretically capture off of that. Ideally, you have a nice clean surface. Um, I drink unfiltered rainwater. I've been doing it for 20 years. You would probably want to store it well, <coughs> as I do, out of the light, and you'll probably want to filter it or process it, boil it, I don't know. But I don't, and I'm alive. But I also don't care. You do, and if you're going to give it to other people, you should care. Like, I don't give people my rainwater to drink. It just... I don't know, my, maybe my immune system is really strong and I'm set up for it. But that way you can have control over your own water system because all over the world, rivers are drying up, lakes are drying up, uh, people are running out of water. There was just a hurricane on the east coast of the United States and that knocked out power and water for people and they're in bad shape. And it's like, this is all so predictable. 
you know, and I'm on survivalist groups and stuff, and I'm seeing posts from people like, oh my God, I thought I was prepped up, and it turns out I wasn't. These are the things I didn't do, and now I'm screwed, and they're just now getting back online. And, and they're learning, at least. All of us should be learning from things like COVID, minor epidemic, really. Well, it's ongoing, and it's a serious problem. I have other solutions for that, how not to live your life full of disease, you know, how to live a healthy life. Um, like, I'm a perfect poster boy of that. But, uh, cheers. Um, but in some ways, I do real great. So, uh, the point is, then, control your water. Second, store food. Have enough food stored up so that when, when there is, not if, but when, there is a disruption in in uh, societal functioning that you have plenty to live for as long as you need to. The Mormons suggest three months uh, and that's really great. Even if 80% of Mormons stored three months of food then that means their whole community is way stronger and when there is a disaster they can then focus on solving the problems and helping each other instead of fighting each other which is what people will do if they don't have water or food. They'll fight each other. It's going to happen. So prepare for that too. But Better than that, better than being a survivalist in your bunker with your guns, is promoting food forest farming all around you, promoting disaster preparedness. Uh, make your community stronger so that you are not as weak. Because if you're the only strong person, you're actually extremely weak. You will be attacked and destroyed. So, um, what else? Electricity, go solar, sure. But uh, a lot of people have tons of solar panels on their roof, and then they got big battery systems that are really expensive, and those are going to go bad. They do go bad. Mine are bad right now. It's a big bummer. Uh, instead, there's this word that you're not going to want to hear. Not if you're, you know, going to try and defend your consumer lifestyle, and that is conservation. Learn to need much less. Stop buying so much dumbass shit. You don't need it. It's going to get more expensive later. And so you might as well adjust now. Adjust to the post-apocalypse now. Adjust to, adjust to a post-collapse post, post -collapse situation by needing less. And and I do, I've done that. I need very little. <laughs> by comparison to most people. Uh, oh, my God. Can I make it home? Yeah, I can make it home. Fuck. I hate it when I can predict what's going to happen and it does. And that's what I'm doing right now is I'm predicting a very bad thing you don't want to hear. And you don't want to make changes, do you? But changes are going to happen and you'll either be ready or you won't. Let's get to another very important item and that is composting toilets. Do not go out and buy a fancy $12,000 composting toilet that needs liquids and electricity and all sorts of dumbass shit. Build them the way I build them. Two chambers, you alternate use, Thermophi thermophilic bacteria processes all your shit. You get compost out of it you could use in your orchard or whatever. Or you could even sell it or give it away to a gardener. And it's not shit anymore. It's, it's, it's uh, soil. And uh, I even have composting worms and dung beetles in mine. And they move it around and do stuff. I never have to maintain it. It's just the perfect solution. Do that. You'll save tons of water. And conservation is a way to get richer. You need less water if you learn to use less water. And shitting and peeing in water is the dumbest thing you can imagine. Along with composting toilets, create a pea garden. I have instructions for that, pea gardens, where uh, you pee either sitting down or standing up, depending on how you like to pee. And that water goes underground, kind of like a septic, but it's not as big an issue to deal with as sewage. So it's just pee and it goes down there. It, it composts under the ground. Plants can grow on top of it. Mine's about two meters down. And I've got an upside down bucket that a hose goes into so it never gets clogged up and the pee just dis diffuses into the ground. I'm losing no moisture. And uh, the plant's roots will go down as close as they want to it, as far from it as they want it as they like. You could do other things with urine. You could save it. You can make gunpowder so that you can have some more personal power and not have other people oppressing you. Uh, I don't make gunpowder personally because that I don't think I have. Let's see, urine has what? Potassium nitrate. I need sul sulfur. 
and charcoal. I have charcoal. I don't have sulfur. How do you get sulfur? I don't know. Anyway, that's not on my plans for... I mean, that's so low on my list, I forget about it, you know. I got so many other things I want to build. Another thing I want to build that I haven't done is a solar sauna. I have a wood-fired sauna now that I could fire up and use to keep clean rather than a shower. Because showers and, co and toilets use up all this water. And so if you have a composting toilet and then you have a sauna, you've gotten rid of 80% of your water use. That's pretty good, isn't it? 80%. I mean, you can measure it for yourself. I'm just making numbers up. And I have a very unusual lifestyle. So, But you can definitely save a lot of energy just with some minor lifestyle changes that won't even hurt you. In fact, with a composting toilet, you don't even need a plumber anymore. So you're actually making your life easier. No water bill, no sewer bill. Now, my, my, my son is wood-fired. I don't like to load it with wood. It takes too long to heat up. And I don't do it because I'm lazy. So I'm just dirty. But if I build a solar-powered sauna, not photovoltaic, but with evacuated tube solar hot water heaters, then I can have that sauna fired up all the time. And I can use it whenever I like. I'll just drink lots of water because I'm going to sweat. And skin will peel off of me and I'll be the cleanest person around. Super clean. I could try and raise money for that because i got to raise money to survive somehow. I'm, I live on donations entirely, and if you're listening to this, please do consider donating. You can figure out how to, and I need it. Uh, I, I have enjoyed living the way I live. I enjoy living like a homeless person with a lot of home in nature. It's great. But uh, that lifestyle almost killed me once, and it will eventually kill me. I have to have some support from somewhere, and if you're watching this, then theoretically I'm offering you something. Theoretically, you're getting something out of it, especially if you're considering crazy options of other lifestyles to, to lead or move into another country, maybe. So find a way to support me. Do it. I never ask individuals for uh, for donations directly. Not I haven't asked one single friend. I haven't asked my mother, nobody, to say. I've never said give me money please I need it I say it generally so if, if you don't have a lot of money don't give it to me pay for yourself and fix your life start to prep up you know fix people around you closer to you I'll be fine whether I die or not who cares doesn't matter so I'm not asking you personally I'm sending a general note out to the world that I'm gonna die living the way I do it's a sure thing and fine no big deal but I'm trying to be as beneficial to the world as I can be. Uh, back to the topic at hand. Uh, you've got your, your solar sauna, which I will design and you'll build. I'll, I'll build some too. And you've got your composting toilets. You've got your house, which doesn't need any energy to run. Uh, your food is going to come from food forest farming. If you have a lawn, replace it with an edible landscape. There's great books on edible landscaping. Uh, you can consult with plant geeks to find out what to grow that needs no irrigation. Because what really uses the most water? It's growing our food. And there'll be some assholes out there who will tell you, see I almost censored the word asshole there, just to be nice to the sensitive people among you, but no. A bunch of people are assholes, I'm going to call them that. A bunch of assholes say, don't say we're like assholes. Um, a bunch of assholes out there will say, well, I don't have to save any energy because industry uses it all. All these other people use so much. And it's not my fault that things are so messed up. And it's like, no, it's your fault that you don't take control of the one person you have the most control over, and that's you. Take control of your life. Take some personal goddamn responsibility. And then, of course, you're going to be buying food, too. But you can also determine how much water you're using based on whether you shop locally, what kind of foods you buy. You know, because not everybody owns a forest. I'm totally aware of that. People have said that to me. They're like, well, not everybody can live like you. That's how they talk. Uh, they're right. But you can do what you can do with what you got where you're at. I can state that better. You can do what you can where you're at with what you got. Uh, and you can be helping people around you. You can be inspiring them. You, you could team up with people who do have land and don't know what to do with it. And, and you could be helping them plant things that 
It may take, you know, you might plant a walnut tree and it might take uh, longer to grow and produce fruit than, than you have life left. You know, that's a glorious person to be, to plant trees that you'll never see the fruit of. Be that kind of person, you know, plant for future generations if anyone survives at all. Because the way we're going, we're looking at total extinction or something close enough to it. We're looking at everybody you know suffering and dying horribly. And your supposed wealth actually makes you weaker. It puts you more at risk. You you're, you're, you're live a too cushy a lifestyle. Uh -huh. People where I live, they either grow food or they can grow food. And I don't grow as much as I could. I, I could grow a lot more, but it's a bunch of work and I don't feel like it. And food's really cheap here. I live in a good climate. You know, people, survivalist people talk about bugging out. And it's like, I already bugged out. I bugged out 20 years ago. And I'm not as fully prepared as I should be. Uh, because I've been in bad shape for about five years. I'm in real bad shape. Very alone. Losing hope in humanity. And so I need to collect other people who have, you know, very much my same values. And can continue this project after I die. Because who's going to protect the forest when I die? Not me. I'll send my ghost out there. But I'm not sure if I'll be a very good ghost or not. So no excuses. There won't be cities later. Not in the way we recognize them now. I asked a question online, and I haven't answered it yet, but I will. Currently, I'm just watching all the dumb people answer it. And my question was, what happens when there's a big solar storm and all the power goes out, the electrical grid goes out and doesn't come back on? What will you do? And a bunch of people are responding, well, I've got some propane and gasoline and generator, and I'll, you know, I'll be fine until they get the power back on. No, I specified in the question, the power is not going to come back on. And people have a whole bunch of other dumb answers. I don't remember them all, but um, none of them answer the question of it doesn't come back on. What's going to happen in Chicago, New York, even Seattle? What's going to happen in Bangladesh, India? It's going to happen in places where it's too hot or too cold to survive. Because even now, a heat wave will result in deaths because it gets too hot and, and AC is too expensive. It's there, it's just too expensive. And everything will get more expensive. The, the, the golden age of cheap energy is going to go away. And don't mention nuclear power. If we get nuclear power, fusion power, any kind of cheap power, we're going to keep building and just make the situation worse. We're going to put ourselves in a more fragile position, not a safer one. All the rest of the resources we have should be invested into making ourselves more secure. People in Chicago... What happens? I mean, what, you know, New York, what happens when the power goes out? What happens in, in uh, Munich, in, in uh, Berlin, in Oslo? Some of those people are more used to cold than we are. But, I mean, billions of people are going to die. Oh, somebody responded, well, yeah, there was a solar storm in 1980-something, and, and, you know, we got it fixed within this short amount of time. And it's like, no, I'm talking about, you know, like the Carrington event? which was in 1880-something, and that caused a bunch of the minimal electrical systems at that time that existed to go haywire. And geologists find that before that, there was something called the Miyake event, I think, and it made the Carrington event look small. So what's very likely to happen is a solar storm will hit, blow out all the systems, and we will not have the ability to, to, to repair it will run out of the ability to repair it. And that will cause other systems to fail, agricultural systems to fail, disease will skyrocket, water will be harder to get to any, anybody anywhere, uh, pumps won't be working, your cars will all stop, because all your cars are way too complicated. They're like computers in there now. You, know, you used to be able to fix your car. And maybe in the past, in like the 70s or something, maybe cars would have survived a Carrington-type event, a solar flare. Or... Maybe they wouldn't have, but now, 
all your electronics can be fried. You could build something called a Farrington cage. No, is it called a Farrington cage? Is that right? Doesn't sound right to me. Farrington? Faraday. Faraday cage, which is like a wire mesh around something. You could have one for your wallet so no one can use RFID and scan your cards easily. You could build bigger ones. You could have server farms and computers. You could put your electronics equipment in it, and then maybe it wouldn't get knocked out by an EMP or a solar flare, because also an EMP or, or this kind of damaging thing could happen due to a nuclear bomb. We could have a nuclear war. That would potentially knock out tons of electronics as well. What happens when all the satellites go down? What happens when you don't have any internet? What happens when your ham radio is fried? You don't even have a ham radio, do you? You probably don't even know someone with a ham radio. I should have a ham radio. We should have a network of ham radios all across the world in Faraday cages so we can reestablish communication. Right now, we think of ham radio people as, you know, weirdo hobbyists, and it's like, no, that's our emergency communication system. And this town right here that I'm sitting in should have one. I should have one. And and I don't need a license once, once civilization falls. I can just listen for a while and learn about how to do it and not broadcast anything, because I don't have anything to broadcast anyway, and I don't want anyone to know where I am. So if I broadcast, people can triangulate my signal and find me. I could wait until shit hits the fan, and then wait till the secondary shit hits the fan, and the, and the, and the tertiary shit hits the fan, and things calm down, then I could say, okay, who's out there? It won't be hardly anybody. sort of feel like a lot of these zombie apocalypse uh, genre movies and TV shows are uh, kind of metaphors for apocalypse because people see it coming. Fiction does predict the future often, especially science fiction. And people can see that collapse is going to occur. All your Bitcoin, useless. Means nothing. It'll all go away. All your government money, all fake. It's fake now. It's just used to rip you off. Inflation is used as a tax. Everything the government does is to enslave you. I just read today that in, in England, they're actually trying to make a, a law where you have to register if you even have one chicken. The last thing they did was make it so you had to register if you had 50. Now, if you even have one, you have to register. The UK is not a free country in any sense, and the US certainly isn't either. At one point, maybe prior to World War II or prior to the Civil War it was, but after the Civil War, the law changed and everybody was enslaved. They didn't get rid of slavery, they expanded slavery. And then America got rich in the 50s, and people got soft and spoiled. And those kind of empires end up falling. So I don't know. It's hard to predict the future of exactly which thing matters. I don't know whether there'll be a solar flare. There might not be a, a solar storm big enough to matter for 10,000 years. But there was a big enough one to mess us up in 1880-something. So in the next couple hundred years, there'll be one. But I suspect civilization will fall long before that. One big epidemic and we're toast. We're so connected now. Something more viral than covid Governments can't do shit to help you. We've seen that over and over. And if there's a bigger real problem that isn't just localized, no, there won't be a government to bail you out. So prepare. Get tough. Now, the folks I was talking to in my prior conversation are old, so what do they care? And I'm pretty old, so what do I care? Because I kind of care. Like, why should I care? I don't know. I don't have kids. Fuck all you dumbasses who aren't prepared. Fuck all you dumbasses who aren't listening to what I'm saying and doing something about it. Because later on, you're going to be whining and screaming. And, oh, it's just bad. <laughs> whiner, whiner, buckwad. You know, don't be an idiot. And then you got younger generations wanting to blame older ones. And it's like, pff, older people were stupid and so are you. <laughs> so get on board. Get smart quick because you're going to have to be smart or dead. Those are your choices. Get smart or be dead. And truth is, you'll probably be dead even if you're smart. Not a lot we can do. There's actually a lot we can do. And I'm trying the best I can. It's very difficult with no support. 
And, of course, the average person has no imagination or forethought anyway. They're just good slaves, and so they're not going to do anything. So it's up to you. It's up to you and me. If you're still listening to this, then either you're just pissed and think I'm a dumbass. Fine. Go for it. Have fun. Or, if you agree, then we should get in contact. You should at least follow the other things I say, because some of them are going to get more specific than this. This is just whining and predicting about the future. But there's a lot of specific things we can do to build cultural and technological lifeboats for any survivors that don't die. And we don't lose by preparing for some future that may or may not happen. We, we gain right away by creating a lifestyle where instead of being wealthy in fake money, we're wealthy in community, in people, in trust, in creativity, in living the way we're supposed to be living, the way that's fulfilling, you know, have more sex, have healthier food, have a healthier body. That's what makes us wealthy. That's what makes us fulfilled. And even though right now I'm a big, huge failure in some sense, because I, I'm not fulfilled, I'm not happy in that sense, but that's part of the path I have to go on. I have to go to the worst state, and then maybe I'll survive and find a better one, or maybe I'll die. It doesn't matter. It's the path I've chosen. I'm not whining about it, you know, even though I don't like my life the way it is. It's not real comfortable. It's the one I've chosen. I've designed it on purpose. I could have been a rich guy. I was a rich guy. Uh, but I could just have relaxed the rest of my life and consumed. I just saw a note today from a guy who's thinking about moving here to this country. And uh, he's retiring. And he's afraid he's going to be bored. Because he's he's been to places where people have retired and they just sit around chatting and playing games and drinking and... They're in bars and smoking, and, and he's like, well, what am I going to do? And so I wrote him a note back, and then I think it got deleted and didn't post. But, you know, I mentioned, well, then don't be dead yet. You know, you're not dead yet. You know, find some goals, and you have millions of options. Um, I mean, he was a limo driver. He's retiring from being a limo driver. And I said, well, you know, you could have a limo still, and you could give rides for free. Or you could have a tricked out limo and just do rides when you feel like it, you know, with people you like, you know, you could drive from the airport to their place. And so you still get that social outlet, which was his social connection before. Or he could get involved with any cause of any kind that he likes. Or he could learn a new art. He could do so many things that would matter. He could have a big, hairy, audacious goal, like I have, of saving the whole fucking world, which is impossible. It's unsavable. But you can save pieces of it. You can even build better a better world around you. That benefits us now, right now. And I need to do that for myself. Because if I'm going to end up happy at all, not that it matters, but, you know, I wouldn't mind a little more happiness before I die. And I, I talk to people online all the time who are desperate to get out of the country they're in, out of the social setting they're in. Some of them want to get away from their family. They're lonely and they're unfulfilled. And I have solutions for that. So now I have to do the immense work of implementing those. But I can't really do that alone. In fact, doing it alone is exactly what would be failure. I've tried it alone. I can make really fun parties. I can make little festivals. People have a really good time. Yay. So the fuck what? It's boring. I'm looking for people who are like me who want to put everything they got into building a better world and living in a better world. And that benefits us all right away. And I'm going to be really careful about who I do that with. Absolutely careful. I'm going to reject 99.9% .9 of people. Not because they're bad, because there's a higher percentage of good people than 0.01%. But they're not all compatible with my particular visions. Even if you don't like my visions of how to do things, you can still find your 0.01% of people and you can create your own thing. So do that. I'm not important, okay? So don't write me a note and say, <clears throat> well, I don't like what you say, this thing and that. Thing. I don't give a fuck what you think, okay? If you don't like what I think, then go do your own thing. I encourage you. Please do it. Please. For the love of humanity. 
Go do your own thing and make a better world, however you think you should do it. And we probably won't be in conflict. Now, if your vision of the world is to continue oppressing more people, then, yeah, we're in conflict, and I'll kill you. Somebody's going to kill somebody. Because I want to destroy the oppressive world as it exists. And there's a lot of people who say they're against oppression as it exists now, but they just want to become the new oppressors. They, they're not changing shit at all. They just want to change the staffing. And that's not what I want. I want freedom for everybody. And crush the oppressors to hell. So, yeah, do your own thing. I wish you luck. I'm running out of steam here on this. Uh, still checking out my spine to see how much I injured it. I think I'll be all right. I think I just bruised some bones or something. And if I can partner up with people, my risk will go down and my stress level will go down. And my fulfillment will go up. Because finding the right people is what matters. And that's the thing I'm actually working the most on is how to find the right people to partner with. That's probably your biggest challenge too. And I want thousands of them. So good luck to you.